Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Um, we want to welcome you all and uh, welcome the leaders here tonight on his triumphal tour of Madison <laughs> bookstores, book establishments, book festivals. Um, we're delighted to have you. Um, unlike the Harmony Bar, we have different kinds of drinks, but uh, we're going to have fun with the bookstores, I think. Um, Bill, uh, I think, has lined up so many places to go to because he is very welcome in every bookstore, um, in every bookstore around. Um, <coughs> booksellers, I think, we all know are not known for being a particularly conservative lot. And Bill, as somebody who has uh, time and again shown the power of the written word to do good in the actual real world, uh, is very welcome to find us. And, um, he has made his career, as the subtitle of his new collection it says, uh, muckraking and rabble-rousing. And um, I hope you'll pick up the book. It's, uh, it's a great read. As he mentions in there, uh, the title of it is Watchdog, but it is uh, not primarily a collection of the Watchdog columns from this list, but a collection of more extended other writings. And it's well <coughs> uh, on your shelf. Um, as I think uh, almost everybody here tonight knows, one of Bill's uh, special passions is animal rights and animal welfare issues. And he's doing something very interesting at his different stops for the book. He's uh, concentrating on different topics at his different events. And although we'll go into a question and answer uh, period after where I hope you'll feel free to ask him anything, uh, we are going to, tonight's theme um, is animal rights and animal welfare. And to introduce Bill, uh, we have uh, Lynn Pauley and Rick Bogle of the Alliance for Animals. So Lynn is going to come up here tonight to uh, give you a little bit more. Lynn? Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Lynn Polly. I'm co-director of Alliance for Animals. Um, Rick and I were um, honored to be asked to introduce Bill tonight, um, but more so we were touched that he chose the theme animals for tonight's reading. Many people say that animal rights activists care more about animals than they do about humans. And what's lost in that simple stereotype is the fact that we care about underdogs. And any underdog, no matter what species, who can either speak for themselves or aren't listened to. I have great respect for Bill's investigative reporting on what goes behind the doors of the Primate Center at the University. However, I have just as much respect for his courage to delve into any number of locked doors that are unwelcome, unwelcoming, where underdogs have few friends and no one to listen. And lucky for all of us, he's a good writer too. I don't know what I expected when I opened Bill's book for the first time. I think I thought it was going to be um, a series of articles that I had read in the past. But I was blown away by the content and by the depth of the writing. Um, many of the stories I never would have, I, the many of the stories that I read, I had not read before. I didn't know about. I mean, he writes, his stories get published one week, and if you happen to have visitors or if you happen to be gone that week or um, given the breadth of his work if you were like 12 at the time it was written you missed it the first time so the good thing about this book is that you we all have a chance to read these stories um, I don't feel worthy to review this book at all but I do have a few um, comments I wanted to make about a few stories um, one of the stories that he writes was about an autistic um, third grader, an eight-year-old girl, whose family was met with resistance in trying to enroll her into the Girl Scouts. Um, this is an underdog who wanted to be part of a group. And even though the Girl Scouts asked Bill not to write that article, Bill had the courage to speak up and, and, and run that article um, in hopes that such discrimination wouldn't happen again. He also took um, the time to listen to Eric Hainstock as he told his story of being a victim of bullying at home and at school, and who at the age of 15 was convicted at, for first degree murder of Principal John Clang and was sentenced to life in prison. He also visited and researched and wrote um, a couple of articles about the Wisconsin Supermax Correctional Institute in Boscobel. Um, Supermax was described, I have a quote here, at the time. Supermax is taking the cake 
in terms of sensory and perceptional deprivation and social isolation. His articles um, prompted attorney Ed Garvey to take an interest which brought about positive changes. Boscobel is no longer um, a supermax, but it's a maximum security prison. On a lighter note, um, in his personal section of the book, I enjoyed reading about his and Linda's Cabin in the Woods, and um, I really um, read with envy the fact that he spent a couple of days with Allen Ginsberg when Ginsburg was in Milwaukee while um, Bill was an outspoken and active student in Milwaukee. This book has a little bit of everything in it, and um, I thank you for writing it um, and for speaking up for the underdogs, human and non-human. And now my fellow co-director, Rick Vogel. So thanks all of you for coming. Um, I think it's we can't overestimate the importance of the fourth estate, the power of the media and the importance of them as they Sort of keep tabs on what's going on with government and helping the citizens make sense often we only hear what government tells us and so it's nice to have somebody that can dig and give us some other perspectives it's so important um, the investigative journalism is of course key to a democracy but you may all know but maybe you don't um, bill's also the president of the wisconsin um, freedom of information council and so he not only does he use the Freedom of Information Act and the open records statutes, but he also fights to make sure that the statutes in fact work and are um, usable through the public. And for organizations like the Alliance, that's key. I mean, as the many people here know, we certainly um, send them our share of open records requests. Um, so that's, it's so important that that happens. You may not know too that about 10 years ago, the uh, animal rights um, movement in the United States started to put on a gala event in Hollywood called the Genesis Awards. Um, the Alliance has given Bill two <coughs> writing awards, two awards for journalism. We call them the heart of journalism. And after receiving two awards from the Alliance, he was also honored by the Genesis um, Awards. They flew him out to Hollywood. He got to hobnob with uh, celebrities and different people, and not only Bill, but also the Isthmus. And he was actually that he was awarded for about six or seven of his stories that he had written. Um, in fact, as I look back over the history of his writing, he's written many, many stories about animals, and I'm, he's going to share some of those tonight. Um, one of the stories that wasn't mentioned in the Genesis Award, and that he's not going to read from tonight, and didn't make it into the book was inside the monkey house and that particular um, story i believe it's back on the back table um, i know literally changed people's lives in madison and they stopped what they were doing and have worked on trying to find out more what's going on at the university and its use of monkeys since that time that was in um, that was in 2004 that he wrote that he's been working on this for a long time one of the stories another story that didn't make it into into his book was as far as i know was his first article in the isthmus that he wrote about animals and the university it was called um, uw madison was accused dealer's best friend and i'm just i'm going to read the article to you it's not very long the uw madison this is in 1983 1993 excuse me the uw madison has for the time being stopped buying dogs for use in research from animal supplier evan Stebain, who was last month arrested on a federal cruelty to animal charge after two Asian Americans posing as would-be dog meat eaters secretly videotaped him shooting and disemboweling a Bowser at his Circle S ranch in Calumet County near Calcona. But animal rights activists are nonetheless upset by the university's long affiliation with Stebain. Public accusations that Stebain was a monster among mongrels date at least to 1980, when state officials accompanied by a reporter found shockingly filthy and inhumane conditions during an unannounced visit to Stebane's ranch. The reporter quoted eyewitnesses who said Stebane beat sluggish puppies to death against barn walls while children watched. The officials whom Stebane allegedly threatened to shoot had no power under existing law to shut the ranch down. In 1981, 15 years after Stebane was licensed as an animal dealer by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, a probe by the Calumet County Sheriff's Department found that Stebane was getting dogs from an individual who used a fake name to answer free to good home ads. The Appleton Post Crescent, Crescent in 1986 ran a 10 part series on Stebane's ranch, which one former employee dubbed a duck owl for dogs. 
Among the allegations contained in the USDA inspection reports were lodged by individuals that Steve Ain cramped more than 12 dogs into a single pen, tied kittens in a feed sack, fed dogs the carcasses of cats, hit a sheep on the head with a hammer, bled a dog to death via castration, left dead dogs dying for other dogs to eat. In mid-series, the USDA filed charges against Steve Ain, who was eventually convicted on 16 counts of cruelty to animals, fined $1,500 and had his license suspended for 20 days. The UW Madison, which had been buying animals from Steve Ain for at least eight years, saw no reason to stop. I understand that he rectified those particular problems, says Christine Parks, director of UW's Research Animal Resource Center. The USDA gave him his license back. He was legal to do business with. Park says the university was concerned enough to begin making its own visits to Circle S Ranch, but it continued to use dogs, buying an estimated 600 canines annually at about $80 each. Marion Bean of the Alliance for Animals accuses the UW of copping out and shirking responsibility regarding its dealings with Steve Bain. She cites a, recent, cites a recent CNN report that the USDA has since 1985 found 125 violations, 32 involving animal conditions at Circle S Ranch. And a former employee of the UW Medical School, speaking on condition of anonymity, says the dogs Steve Ain delivered in crates were sometimes in such bad shape they had to be revived. They just kind of turned their heads the other way, says Judy Anderson, a UW employee, an animal rights activist who has agitated against Steve Ain for years. I think it's unethical. Even now, Park says it would be inappropriate to judge Steve Ain before the legal process plays out. If the 72-year-old Steve Ain manages to keep his USDA license, which Bean says is up for renewal next week, it's possible, says Park, that the UW might continue doing business with him. Um, we wouldn't read things like that in the Isthmus if it weren't for Bill Leader's reporting. And so with that, I give you Bill Leader. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very honored by the presence of each and every one of you, and I'm uh, particularly honored that among our guests tonight are some people who I've written about who are involved in research at the University of Wisconsin, um, Paul Kaufman, uh, uh, who I've worked about most recently, Buddy Capian was here, Dr. Eric Sangren is here, um, decent people who I have come to respect and who uh, I am honored would come to hear what I have to say tonight. Um, the book consists of three distinct sections. One is opinion columns, one is longer investigative pieces, and one is um, some more uh, personal writing, personal essays. And the first thing that I'd like to read you tonight is from that section of more personal writing. This is one of the oldest pieces in the book. It is from June 1st of 1990, and it's called In Search of the Perfect Pet. It began with me the way it does with most people, that feeling. I guess you would call it a void. Something was missing in my life. Not just fame, fortune, serenity, a lime green Ferrari, Tessarosa, the editorship of the Capital Times, a clear reason for living, etc. <laughs> I had reconciled myself to those absences long ago. What I needed was something to care for, something that would depend on me. I needed a pet. During my three decades on the planet, I have had an array of pets. Most recently, I had tropical fish, which I neglected that. After my young son, Jesse, poured a whole container of fish food into the tank, I pretty much let things go. Months later, I emptied the 10-gallon cesspool after it, it had evaporated to the halfway point and discovered to my horror that one hearty Daniel was still alive and flipping. Tropical fish make good pets, colorful and peculiar, but frankly, they're not real affectionate. The most affection, affection, affectionate pets, of course, are dogs. The only best friend a man can have, they can sleep with his wife and not strain the relationship between the man and the dog. <laughs> my family had two dogs when I was growing up. My dad was dead set against the idea at first, until my sister brought Pepper home as a puppy. That dog would go crazy with joy when my dad came home from work. The only member of our family to have this reaction. <laughs> it broke my dad's heart when Pepper, 14 years old and too racked with arthritis to walk, had to be taken to the Humane Society and be put to sleep. A few months later, just before Christmas, I went back to the Humane Society and rescued a year-old Border Collie from death row. Snoopy, which is what my dad named him, was an amazing dog. He couldn't do any tricks. If you threw a ball, you just look at it. But he could walk on his hind legs just like a person, which is obviously what he thought he was. My dad loved that dog too. 
but this time he died before the dog did. Eventually my mom moved someplace where she couldn't have a dog. My sister took Snoopy, then seven years old and in perfect health, to the Humane Society and, well, no one in my family has mentioned him since. I considered buying a bird, I've always liked canaries, and, and I saw a beautiful orange one in the shop. Too beautiful, I soon realized, to be locked in a cage crapping on the newspaper for the amusement of a tropical fish abuser like me. I also, we also looked at reptiles. Jesse, who was four, was about to attend a ninja turtle party, so we set out to find the real thing. It wasn't easy. In a place called Aquarius Pets in Monona, we learned that the sale of turtles smaller than four inches is prohibited under federal law. And after the salesperson said, because people were getting salmonella poisoning by putting turtles in their mouths. I also learned that turtles larger than four inches are too large for my 10 gallon tank. The same day I drove to Fur, Fin, and Feather on the west side. There I encountered what I thought would be a perfect pet, the chameleon. I watched in fascination as the unearthly creature shifted from green to brown, and as the throat of one of them suddenly flared out into what I later learned was his dewlap. They scampered across the aquarium with dazzling speed. There's something about lizards that is so strange and horrifying, I suspect a person cannot come to terms with it and not be changed. You must accept the lizard in yourself. <laughs> Some of the larger varieties, iguanas for instance, pack more cold reptilian reality into their gaze than I can stand. But chameleons at first seem safe enough. Then I asked the clerk what they ate. <laughs> Crickets and mealworms said, uh, <clears throat> is there some food you can just take out of a jar? Nope, the chameleon will only eat it if it's alive and moving. Nope. I later told Jesse about the horrible things chameleons eat. He was all for getting one. A few days later I went to another pet shop and looked at some mealworms. They were alive and moving. <laughs> the clerk said you're supposed to keep them in the refrigerator. Clearly, these were not creatures with whom I wanted to share my living space, much less my refrigerator. But I resolved then and there I wasn't going to let worms keep me from having other living things to care for that would depend on me. I decided to plant a garden. <laughs> uh, the next piece I want to read is from the opinion uh, section of the book, the opinion column section of the book. And it's actually, of all the things I've written, it's one of the pieces that I'm uh, happiest about and maybe proudest about because I think the world has changed a little in the direction that I thought it should back when I wrote this column. It appeared in Isthmus on February 10th of 2006. It's called Let's Talk About the Animals. Last week, the national group People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals put out a list of the top 10 worst offenders of abuse of animals among U.S. universities. Number one on the list, the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Peter rips the UW for federal Animal Welfare Act violations, for the large number of animals it kills and are subjects to painful and invasive experiments, and for its, quote, unwillingness to make humane improvements, end quote. No one who knows why and how such lists are put together would regard this ranking as authoritative, but neither is it arbitrary. The UW-Madison, which currently houses about 2,000 monkeys, 400 dogs, 500 rabbits, and thousands of other animals as research subjects, has indeed distinguished itself in this area in troubling ways. In 2003, the state agreed to pay $2,600 to settle a lawsuit by a former assistant research veterinarian at the UW's National Primate Research Center, who, allegedly, who alleged she was fired for raising concerns about the cruel and inhumane treatment of monkeys. In July 2004, three marmoset monkeys were scalded to death when staff failed to remove the animals before cleaning their cages. Six months later, the same thing happened to a New Zealand white rabbit. In early 2005, 10 cows died from neglect at a UW-Madison research farm. The researchers' animal use privileges were temporarily revoked. Even without these problems, some of which, it should be noted, came to light because UW officials took corrective action there's ample reason to examine and debate the use of animals as research subjects. How animals are treated says something about our values as a society, our moral character. Serious questions have been raised about the usefulness of this research and the conditions animals endure. The issue merits constant review and debate. The problem, UW seems far more interested in demonizing its critics than in having an open and honest exchange of ideas. 
Recently, I attended an information session sponsored by the Alliance for Animals. Part of the program consisted of activist Rick Marol recounting failed efforts to get UW research advocates to debate. His conclusion, UW officials are afraid, realizing that an informed public would reject the university's animal research. As he put it, they have nothing to gain, they have a lot to lose, and a lot to hide. <coughs> Maybe. But the proponents of UW research I've spoken to, including Primate Center Director Joe Chemnitz and Dr. Eric Sangren, who chairs the UW's All-Campus Animal Care and Use Committee, strike me as thoughtful and persuasive. They could more than hold their own in a debate, which makes their reluctance to agree to one perplexing. A few months back, a UW researcher publicly cited Wiley's, John Wiley, Chancellor John Wiley's, quote, offer of open discussion regarding current the current necessity of animal research, end quote. Local activist Rick Vogel sought to take him up on this, asking for a debate. Wiley shot him down. There was never an offer on my part, nor anyone else from the university that I'm aware of, to debate this issue publicly with you or anyone, he wrote. Does Wiley not realize how small-minded this makes him seem? Is he not ashamed what it says about his own lack of confidence and the ability of his institution to face criticism and defend its actions? Sangren, too, stopped, step, stopped back from discussions he had begun toward a series of debates with, with research critics. Like Wiley, he blames activists including Vogel, who last fall broadcast footage of monkey mistreatment outside the homes of a half dozen UW researchers, an action intended to embarrass and stigmatize. That caused us to lose interest, says Sangren, who does not want to be seen as condoning or rewarding extreme behavior that caused considerable outrage. On the other hand, Sangren has not foreclosed the possibility of a debate. Indeed, he feels his attendance at some alliance meetings has helped him better understand how opponents view the university's ethical obligations regarding animal use. This is the essence of a free exchange of ideas. It's also the reason both sides need to stop viewing each other as evil and start having an honest discussion. The confrontational tactics embraced by Vogel and others do not help their cause, although I understand why people who, are, who feel ignored do desperate things. Equally distasteful are the persistent efforts of UW officials to pay research critics as violent extremists, as when Primate Center spokesperson Jordana Lennon last summer decried the, quote, illegal acts Mr. Rick Vogel, in particular, has been associated with. This was outright slander. Both sides need to dial it down. Maybe all of the research now being done is justified because of the benefits it brings to humans and animals. Maybe some of it is pointless and cruel. Maybe some could be eliminated or conducted more humanely. These are matters worth exploring, and the public has a role to play. We must not avert our eyes. We must not accept assertion as fact. And we must not let the UW-Madison shrink its responsibility to disclose and discuss what it is doing to defenseless creatures. month after that column ran, uh, Dr. Sangren and Rick Vogel participated in a debate which I co-moderated at the UW, very well attended, and it's the first of uh, several such encounters that happened. And I do believe that uh, in the process of those exchanges that something important has happened in the way that the sides view each other. And I don't think they view each other with the same level of fear and distrust and the, the feeling of, you know, the, the the will to demonize. Does that feel true to you? That that there's been a change in that direction? <laughs> I don't should we I don't know if we should debate tonight. Um, I, I, I think it certainly as um, we certainly know each other better. Okay. Well they respect you and uh, and I think uh, people on your side have come to res respect them um, more than was once the case. The next piece I want to read is um, I'm going to read you from two longer um, pieces in the book, and I'm only going to read you parts of them. But um, this one here uh, appeared in Isthmus in May of 2009, one of the uh, latest pieces in the book, and it's called My Monkey. The first entry for April 26, 2004, sets the tone for much of what follows. Born today, rejected by mother male infant. 
Thus begins the life story and paper trail of RO4040, a rhesus macaque monkey at the National Primate Research Center in Madison. He's one of the center's nearly 1,500 non-human primates used for experimentation and research that draws $46 million a year into the UW-Madison. But he's not just any monkey. He's, I know this is an odd thing to say, my monkey. I was there on the day he was born, getting a tour of the facility for an Isthmus article, Inside the Monkey House, published in June of 2004. Back then, my tour guides brought me into a bright and sterile room in which RO4040 lay in an incubator. At first, he looked dead. Then he slowly opened his tiny eyes. I may have been the first person he ever saw. And what a sight it must have been in the lap smock, mask, shower cap, and clear plastic face shield all visitors must wear. In the five years since, I've thought often about RO4040. What kinds of studies and experiments was he being used for? Was he even still alive? Would knowing what his life was like support the arguments made by the center's proponents that it does vital research under the most humane conditions possible? Or would it bolster critics who say these animals are pointlessly abused? Some things I knew. RO4040 had never had anything like a normal or natural monkey life. He'd never seen the sky or sunlight or grass or trees. He never foraged for food. The only living things he encountered were other monkeys and humans covered head to toe in odd outfits. His life was expropriated to serve human interests because humans have decided they have that right. As the five-year anniversary of my visit neared, I asked for records regarding the use and care of RO404. The UW ultimately gave me 25 pages of entries that collectively told the story of my monkey's life. For several years, RO404 was housed in a pen with other juveniles. Now fully grown, he lives with another monkey in a tiny cage in a room full of other similarly paired monkeys. It's common for monkeys in captivity to develop neuroses and even psychoses. They may engage in repetitive behavior like pacing or self-mutilate. My monkey seems to have spent much of his life suffering from chronic diarrhea and being injured by cage mates. But the most shocking thing was the experiments RO404 has been used for during his first four, five years. Almost none at all. That prompted me to ask further questions of my monkey's keepers and ultimately brought me back into contact with him face to face. Uh, I'm going to pick up uh, later in the piece. Um, listed on the printout I received from the Primate Center are hundreds of events in the life of RO4040. It catalogs the chronic diarrhea and repeated injuries. But aside from routine DNA profiling and one brief placement in 2008, my monkey has apparently not been used for any research. The animal welfare advocates I share the report to find it appalling. RO404's life, taken as a whole, has to be balanced by the purported claim that using him is helping us, says Rick Bogle, Madison's best known opponent of primate research. He sees no evidence of that. So far in his first five years of life, it seems likely that he has been miserable. And for what? But Primate Center Director Joe Chemnitz and Buddy Capuano, who pair up for two interviews with me in Chemnitz's spacious office, see it differently. They think RO404 has had it pretty good. This animal has not had a difficult life, says Capuano. He's healthier and happier than a lot of animals without being obese. And the traumas he's experienced are the normal things you're going to go through growing up like chronic diarrhea and attacks by cage mates? Absolutely. RO404's record shows he was reported for injuries 20 times in 2008 alone, apparently without the culprit or culprits being identified or removed. It wasn't until January 26th of this year, 2009, that RO404 was removed from the group setting and paired with another male. My host explained that it's not unusual that RO404 has not been used for experiments. Most researchers want to wait until the animals are young adults. Very few get used before they're five years old, says Capuano. In fact, RO404 has just been assigned to a pending project for infectious disease work. It's been determined that he lacks natural resistance to infections, which makes him an ideal subject. I press the pair on the sentience of monkeys. These are highly intelligent animals who can count, problem solve, discriminate between types of music, even empathize. One study found that rhesus monkeys will go hungry if getting food means shocking another monkey. 
Isn't it sad to see them spending their whole lives in cages? Capuano and Chemnitz disagree. If you watch the animals, they don't look chronically depressed or sad, says Chemnitz. They are born here. They are fed and cared for. And the center tries to make their lives as enriched as we can. Capuano agrees. I'm a veterinarian, he says. I took an oath to protect him. Early one morning in April, I arrive at the Primate Center to take another tour. As in 2004, I've had to get a two-doctor visit tuberculosis test. What's new are the 30 pages of rules to review and sign. The security guard summons Capuano, who leads me to a room where I meet some animal care staffers at the start of their shift. The center employs about 100 people, half of whom have regular contact with monkeys. Capuano warns me about some of the problem be primate behavior we may observe. These animals don't know even me very well. They may respond to us aggressively and show off. We head to a locker room to strip the socks and underwear, then dress in official guard, full coverage scrubs, mask, shower cap, face shield, a double layer of latex gloves. We ride an elevator to our destination, then enter a room with about a dozen double cages, each less than four feet in any direction. RO4040 and his cellmate, RO4060, are the only two monkeys in the room, in an upper tier cage. Capiano says the room is going to be hosed down later that day, as is done every two weeks. These two were left behind for now, pending our visit. Both monkeys react with alarm to our intrusion, pacing quickly back and forth, and on several occasions throwing their bodies against the side of the cage, making a crashing sound. I try to take some photos, but it's difficult. Capiano asks if I'd like RO4040 put into a smaller enclosure nearer the floor. This will require the assistance of one of the staffers I met a few minutes ago. While we're waiting for her to arrive, Capriano shows me a pair of larger, vaguely zoo-like rooms across the hall, joined by a transit hall. Both are also empty due to renovations. Here, I'm told, is where RO4040 spent most of his life, housed with about 10 other rhesus macaques. Capiano also shows me a room like RO4040's that happens to be full of monkeys. They dart about and make a lot of noise. Each cage contains a red plastic ball, one of the enhancements provided by the center to keep the monkeys occupied. For a minute, I am left alone by the doorway of this room. Suddenly one monkey, a 10-year-old male, leaps onto the cage wall, clutches the wire with all four limbs and pulls his body violently into it eight times in rapid succession. Bam, 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 bam. In the hallway are two large cages, each containing about 10 tiny marmoset monkeys. They perch shoulder to shoulder on the top rung, as though posing for a family portrait. We make our way back to RO404's room. The staffer, who I, who I hardly recognize in her getup, holds a transfer cage up to RO404's enclosure and creates an opening. Like a shot, he rushes in, hitting the far wall. See how fast he did that? Asked Capuano, explaining that the monkeys are taught this for when they must be moved. RO404 exits the transfer cage into the smaller enclosure just as swiftly. I make mostly unsuccessful attempts to photograph my monkey as he darts nervously about his strange new environs. He regards me warily opening his mouth in an obvious threat. Even when he adjusts to our presence, becoming, says Capuano, more comfortable, there is still fear in his eyes. I wonder what I'm doing here, taking this picture, using it. Is the trauma my visit causes justified? Because I plan to write about it. <laughs> Last piece that I want to read part of is uh, something that appeared in Isthmus in November of 2007, and it is called To Kill a Turkey. Ken Wolf told me exactly what to expect. I'd hold, I'd hold my bird's head and body down to the ground. I'd put a parry knife in its mouth and cut the back of its throat. Then I'd hang on. A turkey is a very strong animal, he warned while its lifeblood spurted out. You'll be able to feel it, Wolf said. When the last heartbeat goes, you'll know it's dead. Wolf imparted this information casually across the, his kitchen counter. The local poultry farmer, who I called out of the blue the day before, readily assented to my request to process my own Thanksgiving turkey. 
To him, it made perfect sense. To me, it was a harder sell, despite being my idea. I knew if I planned to have turkey for Thanksgiving or on a sandwich for lunch, it was appropriate that I do this. All my life, I've been having others kill the animals I eat. I try to buy meat from organic farmers, but I'm not a vegetarian. Animals die to feed me. They die in places I never look and try not to think about. Once in a supermarket parking lot, I saw a truck with a bumper sticker that asked, what's more ridiculous than a meat eater who doesn't hunt? I trotted after its owner, inspired to make a wise guy reply, a hunter who doesn't eat meat. On reflection, I'll concede the guy's point. If you cause the death of animals through your dietary choices, you ought to be willing to pull the trigger. But for a non-hunter and a self-proclaimed lover of animals, the cognition comes easier than the execution. There's a reason people like me let others do their killing for them. We're cowards and hypocrites, not to mention fools. Our urge to look away when someone else kills the animals we eat is so great that our heads stay turned while their genetics are scrambled and their bodies are pumped full of chemicals. My will to kill was inspired in part, part by Michael Pollan's great book, The Omnivore's Dilemma where he slaughters chickens and hunts a wild pig. A photo of him beaming proudly over his fallen prey later moves him to revulsion. I felt that I had stumbled on some stranger's pornography. Yet he eats what he kills, just as he's eaten hundreds of animals killed by others. And so, for this Thanksgiving, I set out to know the animal that ended up on my table and to play a direct role in putting it there, beyond slathering some oil, sprinkling some salt, and sticking it in the oven at 325 degrees. In the process, thanks to Ken Wolf and others, I got an education in poultry farming, organic and otherwise. One thing I learned is that for most turkeys and chickens raised in America, there are far worse things than death. The modern American diet, in the modern American diet, poultry is king because it's cheap. You can buy a whole chicken for about a dollar a pound. Turkeys in season are even cheaper. Annually, the United States consumes 10 billion chickens, that's not a typo, and about 300 million turkeys, including 45 million each Thanksgiving. Almost all poultry served in the U.S. comes from huge operations like Butterball, Genio, and Tyson. The market for organic chicken and turkeys is minuscule, less than 0.1% of the total. Some years back, I drove past a turkey farm in Minnesota. You could smell it from a mile away, but there wasn't a turkey in sight. The birds, thousands of them, resided within long white enclosures. You'd never know they were there, except for the odor. Commercial turkeys live in darkness and filth, with hardly more space than they need to stand. Their beaks and toes are lopped off at birth, with no anesthetic, to keep them from hurting other birds in close confinement. They're foragers, and if they don't have anything to forage, they end up pecking at each other, explains Karen Davis, president of United Poultry Concerns in Virginia. The genetically modified birds are given antibiotics to boost growth and prevent disease. It's been calculated that a human baby that grew as fast as a commercial turkey would weigh 1,500 pounds at 18 weeks. Some turkeys get so big they can't support their own weight, and they use their wings in pitiful attempts to walk. I uh, talk about Ken Wolf, who uh, was a poultry farmer, and how he came to that vocation, his whole life of um, uh, relationship with animals and, and raising animals for food. And I talked about the Amish turkey farmer where we got the turkeys that we were going to uh, slaughter. His name was Elmer Beachy and he lives on a farm in Vernon County. Or, uh, uh, yeah, it's Vernon County. Beautiful farm and the animals there are, are have the run of the hills and it's a beautiful place and got to visit the turkeys in the wild. Uh, and take their picture and, and see them, hang out with them for a bit. I'll pick up uh, at that point in the story. Less than a week after my first visit, I was back on Beachy's farm, opening the hinged lids of two crates while Wolf and Beachy seized turkeys by their thrusting legs. One by one, they inserted the birds upside down into the crates. I held the lids together with my feet as Wolf instructed. These are beautiful birds, Elmer, Wolf remarked. You did a good job. Beachy was matter of fact. A lot of good eating here, he said, stuffing in the sixth and final bird. 
I fastened the lids with bungee cords and we drove back to Beachy's house. We weighed the full crates on an ancient scale, subtracting what they weighed when empty. It came to 20 pounds per bird. Just pay me what you think you can and come out okay, said Beachy, suggesting a price. Wolf topped it, paying a dollar and eighty cents per pound, more than half what he'll get per pound after processing, when the turkeys will weigh about twenty percent less. The caged turkeys seemed calm, their snoods changing color from pale pink to bright red to purple blue. This is done for show, like a peacock spreading its tail. On the way home, I watched them through the rear window. Some were blanky eyed, like my dogs when they're tired. At 8 a.m., Wolf and I agreed to dispatch my turkey the following Friday, the last in October. At 8 a.m., I arrived at Wolf's house in East Bristol. The bird he had picked out for me was in a pen in his backyard, near a table and a pail of water being heated. It was, he said, the biggest and most dominant of the bunch. Wolf showed me his forearm marked with deep scratches. My turkey had done this to him the day before, despite all Wolf's experience when he moved it to this backyard pen. That's how powerful and unpredictable they are. 20 pounds of muscle and hollow bones. There wasn't a lot of ceremony. Wolf grabbed the turkey by the neck and it reacted violently, thrashing its wings and jabbing its legs in all directions. He set it on the ground, holding down its neck with his hand and its body with his knee. He called me over to take his place. The bird tried to push upward and I was astounded by its strength. I had to squat on top of it to keep it still. A moment later, Wolf was back with a parry knife. The turkey's mouth was open, and he told me to insert the blade and make the cut from ear to ear. I knew this moment was coming. I thought this is where I wrestle with my conscience. I tell myself this turkey had an uncommonly good life on a farm in Vernon County. We should all be so lucky. It was raised for one reason, to be, in the end, good eating and death would come swiftly. But could I really kill this animal? And for what? So I could have a tasty meal? My son is a vegetarian, so are some of my friends. They manage to eat without animals dying. Why can't I? None of these thoughts occurred to me. There wasn't time. I started inserting the knife, then hesitated. Can? He took the knife from my hand and plunged it in, severing the arteries at the back of the throat. I don't want the animal to suffer. A way of explanation. He gave the knife back to me and I made another pass. Blood was flowing from the bird's mouth. It stopped struggling almost right away, but I could feel its heart beating against my thighs. Seconds later, it stopped. That's it. I picked some of those things because I, I wanted to implicate everyone, including me. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I mean, I just have to ask after that last story, so why aren't you a vegetarian or a vegan? Well, I'm, I'm heading in that direction, but I haven't made that the thing. Because I What's justify hard? it. I justify it in my own mind. And I, I even have this, this justification about how if you do support uh, organic farmers and farmers who take good care of the animals that you create a market for that type of change in the world and that that's a good thing and I know there's a good argument you can make against even participating in, in the death of animals to that extent but I, I haven't uh, made it convincingly enough to myself. Can I ask one follow-up question? Sure. Before so, so this is, goes back to the beginning is how did you get interested in writing about animals at the very start? Well, you know, the story that uh, Rick read, I've come, I have almost completely forgot that story. I mean, when he read it tonight, I, I, I it was new to me in some respects. I know I wrote it, but, you know, I, I don't remember that bit of reporting. Uh, I do remember a story I did um, before I started writing about the primate center. It's about a guy named, what was his name? He was like a book light. Barry something. Barry Do you know who I mean? Barry. Herbeck. 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 Barry Herbeck. Yeah, the guy that had the dogs in the had garbage the, can in his living room. The dogs room in the garbage can yeah. with their mouths uh, yeah. cut, cut with tape, and yeah. your your predecessors at the your predecessor yeah. at the Lancer Animal uh, 
Casca, Tina? Tina, Caskey. Caskey. She came and she brought me photographs of that and at work, and I opened it up and I, I just, I, I, I went out into the hallway and I just cried. I just, I just couldn't believe the monstrosity of that man's cruelty toward these beautiful animals, this beautiful dog who he basically tortured to death. And then he got caught because he threw the parts of his girlfriend's cat down the garbage disposal and it didn't go down and she found it there and she realized that's what happened to her cat that he ground it up in the garbage disposal. And that's like, he got like 12 years in prison. For and he did all this in front of his kids. Aww. Yeah. Anyway, I, I remember that story. And then um, the fact that we have a primate center here and that uh, Madison is possibly the world leader in terms of uh, experimentation on primates. More animals are used for experimentation in Madison, Wisconsin than uh, anywhere else in the country, according to the USDA from a couple of years ago. I think it held true for 2007, 2008, I'm not sure. But it still holds true. It doesn't mean we have the most monkeys, but we have the most monkeys used in experimentation. Not primarily because of the UW-Madison, but primarily because of the UW and Covents, which has um, five or 6,000 monkeys uh, in its Madison facility. Um, but, you know, knowing that we are the center, um, I think it's an important issue for Madison. We need to deal with these ethical issues as a community. Um, Rick Meralt has a opinion piece that's coming out in tomorrow's issue of Isthmus, uh, which I think is an important piece of writing that challenges the community to think about the ethics of animal experimentation. I think it's important that this community uh, have that debate because we are this center and also because you know we have a university where people are willing to engage the issue to their credit they're willing to talk about what they do and why they do it uh, and to participate in this discussion so we need to have it in part because of their willingness I know there's a limit to their willingness to debate that is perceived on the part of people who would like this issue to be you know more of an issue but um, some things are happening, some things are possible, and I do agree with Rick Meralt in his piece yesterday that this is an issue that, continue, that should continue to be um, front and center of the consciousness of people in, in Dane County and in Wisconsin mm -hmm. and Madison. I was wondering, aside from moving more towards vegetarianism, how have you changed as a person from writing about animals maybe all over, over all these years, or as a reporter or how has it changed you? Hmm. Well, you know, I've, I've come to have really deep respect for people on both sides of this issue. And I know that uh, I don't want to seem wishy-washy on it. Maybe I should take a side and say these are the people right. I will say this, that as a journalist, the side that most appeals to me are the people who say, why are you doing this? You know, isn't this wrong? I think those are the are important people. It's important that we have people in this community who are asking those questions. And I feel like their role is urgent and uh, deserves attention, you know? And it's probably closer to what I think. But I also think that on the other side are, are very thoughtful uh, people and, uh, and, and earnest and decent. And, um, and that, uh, you know, it's, it's changed me to the extent that I think I've tried to encompass both those worlds. When I wrote the piece about Dr. Kaufman earlier this year, I had a really clear goal. I think I even told him that. I wanted to write a piece that Rick Bogle and Rick Meralt and Dr. Kaufman all thought was fair. And, you know, if, if I succeeded in doing that, that, that was really the, the ideal there. Good. Paul didn't bring tomatoes tonight, so he must have. <laughs> No, he was very, he was very gracious subject for a piece of I do eat tomatoes. They're vegan. When the time was here, who would like more debate on this issue? I yes. As follow up to some of the discussion that happened at the Dane County Board, uh, UW now has a commitment to have a series of public forums on animal research. I was curious what your thoughts were about what might be helpful to have as the subject more specifically of that kind of public discussion. I think you, I don't want to pass the buck on it entirely, I think you do need to talk to 
to the uh, Lynn Pauly and to the two Ricks and people who are involved and can get their benefit. I do think that um, there are at least two distinct issues that merit intensive review. One is, um, is the research necessary in terms of making the scientific advances? I mean, do you really need to use animals? Are there other models that would work just as well? Uh, are there problems with using animals that maybe confound the reliability of the results to such an extent that you uh, you shouldn't just you shouldn't be justifying it you shouldn't be continuing it you should be moving to those other models the whole you know is it uh, is it effective and then the second whole thing is is it right is it moral do human beings have the right to experiment on others other species just because they are other species and we put ourselves uh, above them in the in the grand scheme of things. And I think there's a third issue too, which is, are the conditions under which uh, animals are treated in Madison and Dane County as humane as they can be? And here I would say in my own experience, the answer is no. That the, uh, that the uh, life that is lived by a monkey at the primate center, uh, or presumably some other research animals on campus, I don't know what, where the dogs live or how they live, um, could be better. Uh, and there could be opportunities for truly humane advances like sanctuary for some of the <coughs> animals where, you know, if they give 10 years of their life to research, they should have 10 years of their life to swing on a vine uh, and see the sky and to, and to, and to you know, climb a tree and, and know the grasses. So I could see those three things, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, and, um, I think everyone has to come to it honestly with what the uh, limitations are. I know that money is the big factor in, in not doing more, but um, you know, we manage to come up with lots of money for lots of things that I don't think are all that valuable or worthwhile. Maybe there's a way. I was wondering if you were to be doing any, you know, writing on the situation both uh, locally and nationally in terms now it seems okay. like there's a big vendetta on behalf of the Department of Agriculture. And I don't think, I haven't seen or heard anything about anybody getting to the root of it as far as, you know, following money trails and whatever. Uh, but it seems like the Department of Agriculture is going crazy with trying to eliminate all of Okay. I think it's a, a, a valuable uh, issue because the, uh, there was that accident involving geese out in New York with the plane. And then somehow or other the message came down, we have to kill the geese near the airport. Um, but, you know, Dane County Airport has not had incidents that would seem to suggest that it's a huge danger here. Right. One, and killing the geese at Warner Park isn't going to keep geese from being in the vicinity of airplanes. There's just so much other wetlands around that, you know, it seems kind of strange. Why go after these geese? And there might be a competing agenda here in that a lot of people don't like geese in parks because they leave droppings. And this was, you know, boy, this is a way we can get rid of them. I think there's some of that going on. I am aware that the parks uh, people, when they were proposing this, uh, made a couple of references to the other, you know, aesthetic concerns about geese. And, you know, it might be part of their reason for doing it. And there have been some suggestions from people in the community um, uh, Trish uh, O'Kane and, and others about here are strategies that other people have employed to get the geese to move on that doesn't involve <coughs> killing them. And we can do those, why not? I know all of yeah. that, but my, my question pertains more to I, I believe that there's some kind of national movement that FDA is behind and that there's money involved in this somewhere. And I'm wondering if anybody, if you or anybody else is going to be doing more exploration in that area to find out specifically why the Department of Agriculture is yeah. going so crazy with wanting to eliminate geese all over this country. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, one thing is a national story. It's not really the really main to do it. There may be some reporters who are looking at it, national reporters who are looking at it as a national story, and that, that's appropriate for them. I'm often skeptical when people uh, perceive hidden agendas to things because 
often the real reasons for why things get done aren't so hidden, aren't so mysterious. Uh, some people don't like yeast, and it's a natural reaction when <laughs> there's a uh, accident involving yeast for someone to say, hey, well, let's get rid of some of these. Uh, so I, I don't know that we need to, to look for uh, money trails or stuff on an issue. Maybe they're there. I, I'm not saying they're not. I just, I just uh, we did a story that I thought was really valuable uh, uh, with a veterinarian here in Madison. His name is Jen Zubau, who uh, you know is very upset about the bees issue because he loves animals. He's also a pilot. He flies out of Truex all the time in his private plane, and he just <coughs> asked around, "How big a problem is this that we need to start killing all the bees?" And he couldn't find a pilot who had any experience that would seem to justify this reaction. And so, you know, he came to those meetings and you know, has emerged as a spokesperson for this issue. Um, I would just say it'd be interesting to come back in 50 years and see how the attitude has changed towards this issue. If you look back and see what the United States did to Guatemalans 60 years ago or to black people in terms of introducing syphilis and not treating them, the attitude might be quite different. Yeah. And I wonder sometimes on the issue of animals whether that's part of the evolution of man toward uh, man, humankind toward um, more humane uh, relationships with the animal world. I mean, a hundred years from now, two hundred years from now, will people look back on the way that animals are treated in this day and age with the same revulsion that people might feel to a concept like slavery? It's possible. I mean, it's hard to apply a future historical standard to a present moment. It's not really fair, but it is possible that society would evolve that way. And if we can live our lives as human beings without having animals die to feed us or to support our medical advances, wouldn't that be better? You know, but you can also look back. The same thing with history of science. Yeah. And you, and you can look back 200 years ago, 300 years ago, and say, why on earth did they do that? And again, that, that's sort of, as you say, it's the evolution of, it's not, it's not just an evolution of our humanity, it's the evolution of, of our, our knowledge about whatever it is we're trying to do, and we think of better ways to do it, and we think of different ways to do it, um, and that's fine. But of course, we live in the now, and you're trying to help people in the now, or, or as, as in the near future, anyway. So I think you're right. I mean, in time, things, things will change at every level. They, those changes won't always be the way you know, we might still be having other sorts of debates 200 years from now about the proper way to do things. In fact, we always have debates about the proper ways to do things. That never changes. It's probably it's been going on for a thousand years or more. Like, you know, we debate what, what is the right way to do things. Mm -hmm. But that, that's against the context of what is the possible way to do things as well. Okay. You mean the possible defines what needs to happen well, the possible, the possible is part is part of the discussion. That is, what is the imperative? What are you trying to accomplish? What are the tools available to you to do that? And then the ethics issues get placed in the context of all that. But the other part of it is that we know that society, at least we hope society, is going to go into the future. How, if we've got anything to say about it, how do we want things to change into that future? Oh, that's, that's right. That's exactly right. 